Event Horizon, the novelization of the movie, written by Stephen E. McDonald. Prologue. Space is deep. Floating down through night, this thought came unbidden, shot across confusion. The darkness was impossible, filling the universe, pouring down and through, overwhelming. Beneath the cloak of reason rose mindless fear, a chilling wave that subsumed everything that constituted rationality and intelligence. Vertigo followed, the non-world spinning, passing by in an unbearable rush, no beginning, no end. Space is deep. The darkness faded, blurring. All movements in starlight flared. There was no warmth to be drawn from the brightness, nothing but cold that could eat through to the soul, cocooning it in ice. The scientific mind could find a loophole in the terror by speculating about this phenomenon, feverishly working to reduce it to a set of statistics. Of course, it was cold. Out here in vacuum, the temperature would barely be above absolute zero. Space is deep. The whisper again, seeming to fill the universe, floating, turning in its unreality, protected against cold and vacuum. No control, no volition, turning against will. Blue filled the starscape. Coalesced, became a glowing blue orb. Far away and then closer in the mind's eye, close enough to see the patterns of mighty winds. Neptune stood against the starscape, blue majesty in the starry bowl of heaven. This was nightmare, then, not dream, terror rather than release. This was something to be accepted more easily these days, now that time had dulled sensation and numbness was a way of life. The slate had not been erased, but there was no longer a need to feel anything, and that was good. More movement now, plunging helplessly towards Neptune, drawn in. Again, the scientific mind attempted rescue, considering atmospheric components, wind speeds, planetary mass. The silent stream of facts and figures did not cause the terror to recede this time, and a scream rose, only to be lost in the cold silence of space. A fragmentary, rational thought. This was normal. This was the way it should be. Once again, movement ceased. Painfully blue, rife with the energies of its monstrous winds, Neptune filled the sky. This had become a familiar image, from a time when a hole had been torn in the heavens, and lives hurled into it. No sacrifice seemed enough for this angry god. There was a dark spot against the blue, drifting, turning, moving closer now, close enough to make out the outlines of a vessel, sharp and clear, another familiarity in this unfamiliar terrain. Angles formed of titanium, steel, and plastic. Not a small ship, this drifting spacecraft. It had never been intended as a compact craft, a gothic complexity from end to end. It reflected the passion and strangeness of its designers and builders, the inner world of its primary creator. The forward motion did not relent now. Closer and closer then into the metal, into freezing darkness and then into blue light that washed through windows that had no need to be there. There was no gravity, no life support, the only light coming from the cold brilliance of Neptune. Lights flashed and twinkled bluely all around, moving slowly and gracefully through the air. Slivers and splinters of metal, glass, and ice released by some unknown catastrophe. This was the gravity couch bay, lined with tall glass and steel containers, modern man's version of Sleeping Beauty's coffin. No one slumbered in those coffins now, nor were any of the myriad instruments operational. In a dark blur, motion continued. Flashing red scattered the overwhelming blue of Neptune. This was the bridge, crowded with instruments, the air filled with particles of dust and ice. Neptune filled the thick quartz windows, illuminating the corners and crevices. The only relief from the frozen blueness consisted of a single red light, flashing on and off. A bright, bloody interruption. The sigil of an emergency beacon at work. Other lights flickered now as though the ship were aware of an intruding presence aboard. Shadows chased around the bridge, vanished again, washed away by the glare. 
There was something else here. The lights flickered and cast shadows, but one of those shadows was not stationary, floating. Space is deep. Turning without volition, without control, there was a figure at the helm console, hung in the microgravity, tumbling gently. A man in a flight suit that seemed absurdly rumpled. The sleeves pushed back, indistinct darker spots marring the fabric. The man's arms were flung wide, frozen in place, as though his last act had been to fend something off, or, perhaps, to hold on to something that refused to be held in place. Gracefully, the frozen figure spun around. The man's face blurred from shadow to Neptune's harsh light. He had been perfectly preserved in this environment. Of course, that was one detail that could not be overlooked. The eyes were gone. The eye socket somehow blackened as though by cauterizing. Death had been traumatic and swift, the victim caught and frozen in the act of screaming. Turning, the corpse drifted closer, the face recognizable enough despite the mutilation. Space is deep. Plunging back to darkness and then to gray reality, awake, sweating, whimpering, grasping, he found his handhold on reality in the shape of of his name, Dr. William Weir, disgraced creator of the lost event horizon, the stuff of his nightmares, the name of the eyeless dead. Chapter 1. Dr. William Weir opened his eyes and gazed upon a gray universe. Once more vented into pale reality without argument, vented into a mundane world that was, in its own dreary way, as bad as the world that lived in his dreams. Lying on his bed, sheets rumpled around his slender body, he stared at the dimly seen ceiling of his studio apartment. The part of awakening had become ritualistic over the years. The ceiling was his icon, his mandala, so lacking in features that he had discovered that it helped him focus. Over the years, the ceiling had helped him find his way to one idea after another. Many mornings had been spent lying awake, images and solutions tumbling through his overactive brain while Claire... He turned his head, frowning as beads of sweat trickled into rivulets and found their way into the lines and crags of his face. The dreams took their toll on him, even when he failed to remember anything more than a sense of unease. Once awake, he could push the unease, even the terror, to the back of his mind, burying it there beneath facts and figures. He pushed himself up slightly, enough to reach the bedside light switch, flicking it with his thumb. The sudden brightness of the halogen light made him squint. The outlines of the apartment came into focus and he winced trying to deny the sharp jab of pain that always came when he turned on the lights. The pain would pass. It always did. Framed photographs covered the nightstand, leaving no room for anything but the lamp. His glances over the pictures had become part of his morning ritual, as certainly as staring at the ceiling and bringing himself into focus. The pictures were all that he had left, unless he counted the apartment decoration. He had had very little to do with that, unconcerned with the details as long as he was comfortable for the little time he spent there. There was one more picture on the nightstand, this one unframed. He picked it up, lying back in the bed, ignoring the cold places where he had sweated into the sheets. He stared at the image, trying to place himself there next to her, next to Claire. She had looked ill when the photograph had been taken, her skin sallow and waxy, aging before her time. She had smiled bravely for the camera, despite the way she had felt, despite the depression. She had always been strong-willing and wanted to fight her way out of the corners life sometimes shoved her into. He closed his eyes, pressing the photograph against his forehead, willing to turn back time, willing things to change, wishing that their lives had turned out differently two years ago, ten years ago, from the beginning. I miss you. He whispered, and his shoulders shook. He put the photograph aside, opened his eyes again. Nothing had changed. Nothing ever changed. 
nothing ever would. The rules of his physical world did not permit such things and would not per permit him to turn back time. In his world, there was no higher power than the laws of physics. He pushed the sheet away and eased slowly from the bed, trying to stretch, ignoring the little signs of age in his back, his joints, denial of the process of aging, more inactive ignoring the physical in favor of the cerebral, had led for a time to an obsession with the gradual degradation of his body. That had eventually petered out, leaving him only with periodic emails from the gym about renewing his membership and an occasional pseudo-concerned note from his homeopath. He walked into the bathroom, habitually making a quarter turn to go through the narrow doorway, not bothering to close the door. A quick leak in slow motion, then a quick body wash that sloughed away the traces of sweat along with any accumulated grime. He set out his shaving kit, filling a shaving mug with scalding water. He foamed his face carefully and picked up the pearl-handled straight razor, opening it out with a slow, careful movement, reflecting slivers of his lined face. He turned the razor slightly in his hands, saw the hard, cold reflection of his eyes. Dismissing the image, he looked up into his mirror and applied the edge of the razor to his face, shaving in smooth, even strokes. This method of shaving was an anachronism seen as an uh, affectation tolerated or ignored by those who knew of his proclivity. Once upon a time, Weir had preferred it. These days, it was no more than habit. Shaving this way had been another enforcement of precision, another element in the plan shaping his life. As with so much else in that plan, it had assumed the air of reflex. Drip. Startled by the sound, he lifted the razor away from his face. His breathing stilled for a moment. He clearly heard the sound of air whispering through the ventilator grill on the bathroom. Drip. He looked to one side of his reflection, focusing on the bathtub tucked into a corner of the tiny bathroom. Drip. Slowly, he turned around, staring. He felt very cold, but knew that the temperature had now changed. Water oozed from the faucet, coalescing into a large, ungainly bubble of water before giving way to the demands of gravity. Odd, he thought, that gravity demands so much of us that when we rest, we fall asleep. Drip. He turned back to the mirror and resumed his shaving slowly, precisely, and smoothly. He splashed water into his face, toweled himself dry, throwing the towel over the rack when he was done. The bathroom needed cleaning, he noted, but he could not be bothered to stoop to the chore often these days. He picked up his comb and swiped carelessly at his hair, pushing it back into place. He was a scientist, and no one really cared how a scientist looked. Just deliver the super bomb, doctor, and and we'll overlook your breach of the dress code. From the bathroom to the closet and a change of clothes, half-heartedly smoothing out wrinkles. Dressed, he went into the kitchenette to open the tiny refrigerator and stared helplessly into its disorganized interior. New forms of life were being generated in there, he was sure. In the meantime, the examination yielded only the usual archaeological data. One of these days, he was going to have to put something fresh in there or arranged for a biohazard team to remove the fridge. He opened a cabinet, extracted a box of instant oatmeal, added milk powder, water, salt, and too much sugar, irradiating the compound result in the microwave until it was suitably unappetizing and had developed a texture akin to wet, sweetened sawdust. Spooning a mouthful of this unwelcome body fuel into his mouth and chewing morosely, he went to the window. Another mouthful of too sweet mush, then the last part of the morning ritual. He reached out and opened the blinds that covered the window. The starscape blazed in at him, giving color to his gray world. The stars were the main attraction in this habitat section of Daylight Station. Earth lay below them, beneath the south side, and all that could be seen from his quarters was a cheerful glow at the bottom edge of the window, if you lean forward in just the right way. Weir never bothered to try and catch the glow, and he never really looked at the starscape. Never had. His mind always being on something else. These days, his mind was usually empty when he looked out this way, voided in dreams and nightmares. Even so, nothing came to him now. 
only the hard clarity of too many stars seen through a vacuum. He finished his oatmeal, retracing his steps to the kitchenette, putting the bowl into the dishwasher. Several others, crusted with varying amounts of decaying oatmeal, already occupied the top rack. He closed the machine carefully and poured himself a glass of tepid water. The video phone buzzed angrily, startling him. He placed his glass on the kitchenette counter and made his way around to the phone. He could barely remember the last call he had received. No one called him unless they needed something. Most of the people he knew or worked with tried to avoid needing anything from him. The video phone buzzed again. He tugged at his bottom lip, frowning at the blank screened instrument. He scanned the nameplate, Microsoft, N-Y-N-E-X, absently. Then, as the third buzz began, waved his hand over the call pickup sensor. This is where... He said, and was surprised at how dusty and unused his voice sounded. Take a note, Billy Weir, you need to, to uh, socialize a little bit more. The screen lit and cleared. Weir was not surprised at the face that appeared. He could not think of a reason why any other person than Admiral Hollis, adjutant Lyle, would be calling him. Station maintenance, perhaps, but they responded only to service calls, and he had made none of those for a while. Lyle's face, attractive, dark, too young for the sort of position she held in the ranks of the United States Aerospace Command, gazed at him, guileless, composed. She was making an effort then because Lyle never took pains to conceal how tolerant she was when talking to Weir. Never let Weir forget how precious every moment of her time was. Lyle sat at the right hand of God. Hollis had never done anything to disabuse his adjutant of this notion. Composed and smooth, Lyle managed a smile and said, Dr. Weir, Admiral Hollis would like to see you as soon as possible. Weir closed his eyes for a moment, blotting out Lyle's face. He knew. Beyond any hope of rational explanation, he knew. Hollis should have taught his assistant not to make an effort to hide secrets behind a diplomat's mask. He opened his eyes and nodded coldly, and waved a hand over the call hang-up sensor. As soon as possible was no more than mill speak for now. So to hell with Lyle if the adjutant had a problem with his manners. He sighed and then ran a hand through his untidy hair and got up to go meet his fate. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been a Patreon Early Access exclusive upload. The Prologue in Chapter 1 of Event Horizon by Stephen E. McDonald. Um, I gotta say, I've been looking forward to this one, and uh, it's one of my favorite uh, 90s horror sci-fi movies, and I've heard the novelization adds in a lot of stuff that had got cut from the movie, uh, because it was too gory, uh, too scary, and the book is supposed to include that, so I'm really excited about that. A big shout out to Liam Anderson, one of our patrons. He is voicing Dr. Weir. Love the accent, man. Perfect for the part. Uh, you're nailing it. And uh, yeah, uh, if you're hearing this on Patreon, you have heard it two days before it dropped on YouTube. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Um, could not do this channel without you patrons. Thank you so much for keeping the channel alive. If you're hearing this on YouTube, if you would like to support the channel, you can do so for as low as $2 per month. You get some great rewards, including early access to uploads like this one uh, two days before they drop on YouTube. Uh, so, yeah, check it out. Uh, the Patreon link is in the description below. Uh, each week, I'll be dropping a new upload of Event Horizon on Patreon two days before it drops on YouTube. That's one upload of this book each week, and uh, I'll see you next week with more of Event Horizon. I've got a good feeling about this one, and I think we're all going to have a blast, and uh, we're really going to enjoy this uh, sci-fi horror romp 
this story, this movie, uh, gets really dark and really creepy uh, once things start, you know, once once it really picks up uh, later on in the story. Uh, it's it's like this uh, ship was built to uh, automatically be able to like create a black hole and go from one side of the universe to the other in like a split second. Uh, and apparently they pass through hell or something and bring some of it with them. Uh, I'm hoping the book goes into even more detail than the movie. If it does, we're in for a very frightening uh, audio book here on the AD Slasher Library and YouTube channel. Got my fingers crossed, and uh, hope you're excited about this one too. I'll see you next week.